the co-host of this beautiful gathering called Creative Mornings. And this is actually my last Creative Mornings as a co-host. And I'm going to go home and I took off the rest of the day so I could cry about it all afternoon. <laughs> so I will miss you. That's why I did not take off work, but I will miss you. Um, Okay, well, it is an honor and a privilege and a joy to have you here and high five and hug. And I'm so excited to hear from Senator Kurt today. And as always, we're going to start our morning with an manifesto. And fun fact, I've asked four people to read this and I'll say no. So I'm going to do it myself as a love of a memento to leave you in my last day of morning. And I thought it would be. If you want, try an accent or scream the whole thing, I don't really care. But, join me, won't you? Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery, compassion, honesty, and hard work. We are here to support with you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. Thank you. 
sponsor breakfast, so please talk to them. You or your family or your company, you can allow them to make a sponsor. We're down. It's, it's, excuse me, it's so hard to hear you. There's an echo. And you can just yes. Um, yes. How about this? Is that better? Yes. 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 Great. Yes. We'll do that. Um, feel free to not use that mic then if that's better. You're mic'd up. Eddie! Eddie. You guys, Eddie. I know that's your favorite part of the day. Right? Yeah. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Let's give a round of applause. Sometimes in the morning you should just wake up and be like, I'm just going to give myself a round of applause for being so cool. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing like it. It just changes your life when you do that. So try it tomorrow morning when you get up. Uh, so again, my name is Hetty. So glad to be here. I get to greet you all. And I often get to do the introductions. And it's one of my favorite parts of my month. It's just to come up here and introduce some fabulous person that I really don't know. But I get to know them the morning of or follow them on social media and checking them out, right? And so I've never been to this place. And that place is called London. But there's been several people that I have met over my time of living when I ask them, what is your favorite city or place that you've ever been? And they always say London. And I say, why is London your favorite place? And they just like, I don't know, it's just so amazing, right? But this morning, this person that I get to introduce, I asked them, where's your favorite place in all the world? And she said, London. Oh, no, she said London. <laughs> <laughs> she said London. <laughs> That you all were supposed to kill that. I, why the world would she stay in Oklahoma City? You all are so diehard, right? You're diehard people. She said London. And I said, well, why London? And oftentimes people tell me why they love London. But today this woman made a way to my heart when she told me why she loved London. She said, because of the public transportation. I love, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make sure. Yeah. I'll make sure that wasn't another story I heard while I was out there in the cold high-fiving y'all. But she said public transportation. I love public tra transportation. And then so, also when I was just being nosy and following her throughout the week and trying to learn about her, there's another thing that I really love, and that is teachers. I love educators, and her parents both were educators. And also, here's another cool thing about this lady. She's done something that I couldn't do. She ran for office and won. I ran for office and lost miserably. You know what I'm saying? But it was a great thing. And we both love something about uh, being uh, having an opportunity to serve. And that's the people and meeting great people. And ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I want right now for you to go ahead and stand to your feet and give applause for the lady who loves people! Come on! Are people going to enter that? So th this is too echoey? It's too weird? Okay. Can you hear me in the back with this volume? Okay, give me a, thumb like a thumbs down if you can't. Um, are people going to enter this way? Because that's really fun. <laughs> That's happened to me before. Has that happened to you? Yes. Um, thank you for having me. I really am thrilled to be here. Um, and I said public transit and history, I'll say. But truly, my husband and I look at the world and try to figure out where we want to visit, partly by the public transit, which shows that we don't have as much to offer here as we want. So that's why it's so special to get to travel and do that. But if he just asked my favorite city in the world, I would have said Oklahoma City. But he asked my favorite city to visit. So that's why, yeah. All right, so I was asked this morning to talk about roots, and it's really kind of funny to be in this space talking about roots, because frankly, my career in part started here, um, and so this is, the, uh, Untitled and Laura Warner have been a, a key part of my path and my roots, um, so it's kind of cool to be in the middle of art, because that's my background. Um, but what I'm going to start with, um, that's how to get a hold of me. Let's start with this day. So this is November 14th. 2018, which is already sounding like a long time ago. Um, and this is somewhere I never thought I would be. So this is the Oklahoma Senate floor, and this is the day we were sworn into office. So this is us standing up. The lieutenant governor at the time was here giving us our oath, and I'm standing with 24 other people getting sworn into office. There's 48 state senators. Half of us were up for election, 
I didn't know these people. I'd only met a couple of them. Um, and never in my past would I have imagined that I would end up running for office or being involved as a policymaker. Um, and so I think in talking about roots, I kind of wanted to start there, is that how surprising sometimes your roots can lead you somewhere and then you end up being like, oh, well, this made sense all along. I just didn't realize it at the time, right? Um, so when I was thinking about it, really running for office seems like it's a lot about numbers because it's, you know, you've got to get 50% of the vote plus one vote, right? You're counting people, you're counting votes, you're counting money that you have to raise, you're counting the days until the election. So there's a lot of quantifiable things about elections, but really the process was all about people and their roots and my own roots. Um, so I announced for office a year and a half before the election. And from that day forward, everything was about my own roots, looking inside. It's the biggest journey ever inside. Hedy, would you agree? Running for office made, where'd he go? He's already gone. Did he leave? Okay. <laughs> Busted. Well, running, anyone else run for office here? Just out of curiosity. Okay. All right. Maybe this will change. We'll see. Um, running for office truly is a deep journey inside. Um, the whole time you're analyzing who you are and how you're motivated and why, right? And then it's also about the roots of the community. So trying to understand who you might be serving, where they're coming from, what their roots are, and what that community is based in. Who are you representing, right? And so to me, like roots is the perfect theme because it, it fits throughout the year. Um, it really was an 18 month process and it was face to face. So I'm loving the manifesto. I hadn't seen that before, but um, very much a face to face at this level. When you run for state government, I, I went out and knocked on doors and met people face-to-face -face on their doorstep. And I knocked 20,000 doors in 18 months. So by the time, which I never could have imagined when I started, when I knocked my first 10 doors, I couldn't imagine it. But you just keep going and keep going and keep going. And so by the end, I had knocked on literally 20,000 doors. And you, you talked about 25% of the people answer or talk to you. Um, some people try to hide. We know you're there. Um, <laughs> I really tried not to take offense from that because I figured if they didn't want to talk to me, they were busy, right? Or they were occupied with their life. Um, but so around 25% of people you end up getting to talk to. So I had about 5,000 conversations with people on the door about what they care about in elected office. Can you imagine? I mean, it's like the slowest survey ever taken throughout the year and a half process. But it was the most amazing process because throughout that time, each conversation helped me hone what my values are, clarifying to me what was more important than other things. I would be on a conversation with somebody who might um, talk about something that I really don't agree with, but there's times when you're gonna talk to someone about why you don't agree, and then there's times you're just gonna be quiet because they didn't ask your opinion and they just wanna tell you what they think. And so I learned what those things were that I could keep my mouth shut about because I was like, you know, I don't have to correct this person right now. If they wanna talk, and ask me questions they can. Um, other people, you'd agree with them, but they really wanted you to hear them. So I had a year and a half of those kinds of conversations all year long. And then the other weird thing about running for office is you're trying to immediately shortcut people understanding who you are and liking it, right? So I'm standing on your doorstep. I, I mean, I literally would have five seconds to catch someone's attention for them to talk to me because they're like going, I'm busy, I don't want to, why are you ringing my doorbell? Like, this is really strange. Usually they're cooking dinner or they're, you know, doing whatever, working. Um, so you have a really brief time period to try to connect with somebody. And so how do you shortcut who you are? You know, you can't just stand on someone's porch and say, hey, I'm an honest person. I'm, I'm full of integrity. You can just tell by looking at me, right? So you have to figure out what about your story and your roots you can share that will connect with someone really quickly. Um, you know, part, one of my main goals was just to be present with every conversation I attended. So if I'm there, I'm not thinking about something else. I'm seeing who am I talking to right now and making sure I'm, I'm speaking to them. And that, you know, throughout the year, I recognized how much that was a core value of mine um, to, to really try to listen carefully to whoever I was with and to not be distracted constantly. Um, but the other thing is, um, by the end, it's boiled down to roots, but you're trying to tell part of your story that makes sense to people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some goofy pictures um, just to talk about how you shortcut stuff. So that's me upside down. So you start talking about your family. So a lot of people 
when they're talking about their roots or trying to understand where they come from or trying to decide if they trust you, they want to know what you do, where you came from. They want to know why you ran for office. But the thing that really helps people think that they know you better is to talk about your family and who they are and how you were raised. Um, so I was born, in, my, my story's a little too complex to tell quickly. So there's some shortcuts I took and I'll tell you the longer version and then I'll tell you the shortcut version. Which the longer version, I was born in England. My dad was in the Air Force. Um, me and my brother, um, we started school over there. We moved back to Oklahoma when my dad got sick and we needed to be near my mom's family. My mom's family's from here, four generations back. They moved here because they had nothing. They had nothing and they came in the land run and they decided to plant themselves in Edmond because the college was planted in Edmond. And so from that time, my great grandfather traveled with the oil fields, but my great grandmother stayed in Edmond so her kids would get educated and go to college. So in the course of one generation, they went from neither of them finishing high school to everybody getting college degrees, in part because of that commitment they made to that community. On my dad's side, he's from Wisconsin. He was the first person in his family to go to high school, I mean, to finish high school and to go to college. Um, he was the golden boy, golden son. But he chose Air Force because he needed the money. You know, they didn't have enough money to get him through school, so he went through ROTC and became an engineer. So I think you see from both sides, I have the root of education being an important tipping point and turning point. Let's see, what else would you want to know? So when my dad got sick, this is the true crux of who I am, but it's not something that's easy to talk about on a doorstep. My father passed away. He passed away slowly from brain cancer. And what I learned through that is who I am, right? My mother is a super hopeful person. She's got two young kids. Her husband dies. She keeps serving the community. She was still volunteering up until right before he passed. She was super involved with her church. She was visiting um, people who were incarcerated. She didn't skip a beat. You know, her goal was to be responsible in the community and be connected and to serve other people because they served us. And so I saw from the very beginning that kind of uh, focus on hope and what's possible. So the community-minded, service-minded mentality that came through that kind of hard rut time where our family was facing that hardship absolutely formed who I am. Like nothing seems like a big deal if you've gone through that, right? Have any of you all had early trauma that colored your view enough that you're like, all the rest of this is just not a big deal, right? Um, that's who I am. But I'm not going to stand on someone's front porch and say, my dad died when I was eight. That's, that's, doesn't, that comes across as weird, right? <laughs> so it ended up, interestingly, even though my father passed away 35 years ago, they just wanted to know that he was in Air Force and that he was the first to go to college. That was meaningful enough to people to think that I came from a family of service. I talked about my mom being a public school teacher um, when I was growing up. And so those two, those two little snippets were enough to make people feel connected to me. Um, you know, our state is 10% either active duty or veteran, um, which is a huge percentage. I'm looking at my veteran constituent right here. Um, and so it meant a lot to people to know I was connected to a veteran. That, that means something to people, right? So I never in my life would have imagined I was going to talk about my father for a year and a half. You know, he hadn't been in most of my adult life, but those roots were really important. And it was a shortcut for people to understand that part of me. Um, so in college, I had zero direction. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you goofy pictures of my early inklings of which way I was going to go. So I just love to learn. I went to a small college, small liberal arts college in Minnesota, just because I loved to learn. I liked as much as I could. I didn't set a major until I had to, right? But towards the uh, end of school, I got to intern and work on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 4, a great <laughs> masterpiece, right? Uh, this crazy film that was shot in Austin, which is where I went to high school, and I got to work a summer on that. And Truly pivotal moment, plus I'm just proud that I worked with chainsaws all summer. Um, I learned how to, I was, a, you know, working on my um, bachelor's degree and I was proud to change out the chainsaw blades every day. And, but what really came out of that summer was a love of the teamwork 
Like, any of you who've worked on films, I mean, there's just so much teamwork has to happen. One person really shouldn't or can't do it by themselves. And I love the intensity and the creativity of those teams. I'm not the one that's, that's the director. I'm not the actor. But I loved working with these creative teams. And it threw me back to doing theater in high school. And I was always the stage manager, the tech theater person. I was, that's what I loved. Um, I was the editor of the paper. I wasn't the best writer. I was the, so what, what came out of that was that my role in teams was to be an organizer and kind of a, a glue person. And so I lucked out after college. I found my path. I ended up, I worked at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art for a while, putting together exhibitions and hanging art. And then I started working for a wonderful organization called Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition, OVAC. And any of you who are artists who don't know about OVAC, come talk to these women up front because they are OVAC. But so I spent 15 years going around Oklahoma talking to artists and trying to help artists stay in our state. So this organization focuses on technical skills, funding, and exposure needed for artists to be here and thrive. Um, so I went to places like Shattuck, Oklahoma, and met with groups of artists who loved their community um, and were excited about being artists. I learned a whole different way to look at community. There were small towns where one artist changed that whole city's mindset about their city because that creative person stayed and showed some kind of potential. And so this is what made me fall in love with Oklahoma as an adult. This experience of being in small towns, big towns, and seeing the creative potential of our state is what made me what I am. Then that led me into doing arts advocacy. So speaking up for arts funding, public art and arts education at the state level. So I ran a group called Oklahomans for the Arts that focused on helping people um, speak up for specifically funding for the arts. And so this is Arts Day a couple years ago at the Capitol. We had people come from all over the state, try to talk to their elected officials about what they care about. Um, and this is really what got me closer to the legislative process and interested, more interested. I've always been a real active voter, but interested in the grassroots of how things get done in terms of state policy and what that is affected. Money, be it laws, um, trying to understand how that gets done. And that's what got me closer to it. So you probably already hear some themes. So this, this is just a few of the themes I identified over my career as core values. And I don't know if any of you all have gone through this process. Probably lots of you have, because I know that um, design thinking definitely brings you that way. But I actually worked with a, a coach at one point because I was so burned out, so tired at OVAC because we worked so hard and we worked all over the state. And I went to this coach and said I was having a hard time with time management. And he said, let's look at your core values. Like, this is not about your email. This is about burnout, right? And so he helped me with this. And then 10 years later, I pulled this out during my campaign. And it was like, ah, it was like a message from myself reminding me, like in the midst of having 5,000 conversations with people about what I care about, what's important in our state, their own backgrounds and trying to understand how that impacts their view of government, their view of what we should do for our, our neighbors. Um, this was almost like a message from the past for me. So potential being the biggest, that's what motivated me to run for office. I believe that our state can be great. And I don't mean it in that, in, in any kind of thin, one inch thin, thin way. I think in every way we can keep improving and growing and building on the potential. The other big thing I knew from OVAC was every Oklahoman should be involved with that. I want more people to have a voice. I think we make a lot better decisions when more people are involved. So the potential of every Oklahoman is the other part. It's not just about our state overall, but it's about improving, building on the potential. Um, responsibility, I'm sure you could imagine from watching my mom as a kid, that roots of, it doesn't matter what happens to you, you have a responsibility to your community. It does not matter, no excuses. Um, and this deep sense of responsibility that pushed me to take on a job like representing 75,000 people. And then challenge. Clearly, I was used to things not being easy. And so when the state was having its budget crisis and we'd cut education for 10 years and there's so much polarized dialogue and it's so unpleasant and it looks so dysfunctional, did I choose to just hide? No. Unfortunately, I come from a place that I run towards challenges, right? So 
this is another major area that I'd always and continue to do. So I end up campaigning, right? And I, you may have noticed, doesn't this look kind of similar to my picture from the Capitol? Like, so campaigning is a lot like running an organization because you're recruiting people to get involved who care about something. So I got to spend a year and a half, talk about roots, asking everybody I know for money. So I literally got money from like my high school teachers, my second cousins. I was calling everyone I'd ever known for money. And then I recruited everyone I possibly could as volunteers. So it really was that kind of route too. Like what kind of network have you built in a community? There's nothing like a campaign to see what kind of network you've built and whether there's people that are willing to step up for you and believe in you. And then the big night came, election night, and I won. And I had never imagined, like literally the day I woke up, I wasn't even worried because I was like, I have worked so hard for 18 months. I know I've done my part. We'll just see what happens, right? Um, but this is my daughter. I don't know if I'll ever see this photo without crying because my daughter was so proud of me. My family was so proud of me all year, but my daughter came and stood by me. And to, at that night, to look out, and I had all my volunteers and fans and friends. There, I mean, what a pivotal moment to be able to experience that. And so when I feel unconfident in my policymaking or how new I am on the job and how much I have to learn to, to be effective, in the state legislature, I just have to remember, go back and look at some of these, um, this network of people that really helped show me what potential was there. Um, I kind of think, looking back now, it feels like my story makes sense. Um, but going through it, who would have thought, you know, oh, you're going to run an artist organization and you're going to be, you know, wearing overalls in Arnett, Oklahoma. And then a couple years later, you're going to decide you really should run for office. I don't know. But I feel like those core values and those roots are what drove me that direction. This is how you can connect with me. Um, I know this isn't really what you asked of me, but I do want to say that I hope all of you are engaged with your elected officials. Um, I think our system doesn't always make that easy. It's not always easy to figure out who represents you and what decisions are being made at what level of government. But constituents make a difference at the Capitol, um, people are heard. And one of the reasons I love state legislature is it's small enough to have a voice. So people who literally call me two times suddenly become people I know. Um, because out of 75,000 people, I might get eight to 10 constituent calls during session, right? Can you imagine? So your voice does matter. And I know that there's a lot of voices that say that the only thing that matters is big money. Um, but that's actually not true, especially at the local level. Especially at the local level, your voice does matter. And if you can organize with a few other people, it matters even more. Um, so I encourage you, city council, county government is becoming so much more transparent. Great people. I know Carrie Bloomert spoke to this group. She's a great example of someone who's listening to constituents. Speak up for what you care about. If somebody sends me an email about a bill and they're a constituent, I will read the bill again. If someone sends me if I get two messages, I'm going to do more research. I'm going to talk to the author. I'm going to talk to the agency. I'm going to learn more. So even if you don't change a vote, you're helping inform people. They might make better decisions with the information that you're giving to them. And never assume that they already know about whatever issue you care about. Um, because the decisions that are being made are impacting our public education system, our health system, our infrastructure. All the things that we need to thrive um, are being decided at, at the levels of government. Um, not to mention regulation, control, those kinds of issues as well. Um, but I really encourage you, if you haven't already engaged, to get involved and focus first on your elected officials. Um, you don't have to know everybody. You don't have to follow every level of government. For my, I used to just focus on city council, school board, and the state, state legislature. Because I lose my mind if I try to watch everything, right? Uh, so anyway, that's my pitch for getting involved. Um, I want to thank you for having me this morning, like having the roots of artists being the reason why I stayed in the state, why I love this state. Um, it's really exciting to me to be back here and also to be around a bunch of creative people this morning. So thank you. And I'm open to questions, right? There's, there's my organizer.
what was last year, what was last decade, what am I looking ahead, what does the next decade hold? So it was, I was back there pondering and like soaking up every single bit of that. It's so meaningful. Um, we do have time for maybe three questions. If you have a question and would like to ask the senator, now is your shining moment. Anyone? Steve, lead senator, us off. Senator, All right, Steve. My roots are in Shattuck. Shattuck? Oh, yeah. yeah. So my question is, how did you win in a Republican gerrymandered district that you shouldn't have won in? Because it's gerrymandered. Mm -hmm. So my district is very wacky shaped. If you ever look online, it's the microscope looking one. Um, it stretches from Quail Creek in the village, around Lake Hefner, out to Lake Overholster, includes part of War Acres, and then comes back into some of the historic neighborhoods. And so what he's referring to is that my district was designed to stay Republican. And, you know, whatever party you are, I'll just say that having a super imbalanced legislature is not good for policy. Okay, so right now we have a super imbalanced legislature. That means that lots and lots of policies don't get discussed or vetted well before they're moved forward. Um, and so that was meaningful to people I talked to. Um, I talked to a lot of people who party wasn't their first priority. What I heard from people, their first priority was public education. Their second biggest concern, which just blew my mind, was corruption. Feeling like the good old boy system is still running our state and that people are still getting favors they shouldn't. Um, and so that was the next big. And then health. You know, people are dealing with the health. Of, I talked to so many caregivers. Like, that was the big theme last year was... Um, you know, people caring for kids, people caring for seniors, people caring for disabled adults that, they, that are in their family, um, lots and lots of caregivers. And so those were the themes that mattered more to people than party. Um, some people did shut down about party lines, so I, but out of the course of the year, not that many slammed the door on me. Um, and if they focus on party lines, usually they're watching a lot of national media. And so they would actually say the same things as other people on the block. So like, one day I was out and someone said something to me, pretty specific, and I was like, and then the next person used the same words, and I thought, well, this must have been on TV last night, because this is strange. Like, no one's ever said this to me. Like, someone said, oh, I have to vote Republican all the way down the ballot. And then the next person said it the exact same way. And, I, and so then I found out, oh, yeah, that, you know, this has just been talked about. So, you know, if people are dead set on it, I'm not trying to, like, I was really pretty hands-off. I wasn't trying to be a salesperson. But is that serving you? You know, is that serving governance if whoever signs up with a certain letter by their name is one who wins? Um, what I found out through the process is anyone can run for office. All you have to be able to do is meet the residency requirements and pay the fee. So literally there's no test for who's what party. And I think that I try to talk to people about that. Like you, you kind of assume, like even being somewhat knowledgeable, I assume there was some kind of filter that happened. There's zero filter before, before filing. Anyone can walk in that door and file for office if they're a legit resident. Um, so like, know that you need to ask them hard questions. And then I was fascinated, this is not what you asked, but I do wanna say, people did not ask me hard questions. And it may be because I was interrupting their day but some of them, I would see them a second time or third time, and I really only got stumped a couple of times. Like, people would ask me about real specific issues that they wanted a yes or no on, but people didn't ask me hard questions. But one day, I had a woman, she probably comes to Creative Mornings, like, she was like, she said, well, how are you going to do that? Like, I was talking about being informed, and um, I can't remember what else. You know, my big, my big thing is about making decisions with as much information at hand and being collaborative. And she was like, how are you going to do that? You're only one of 48. What are you actually going to do? And she wanted me to talk through, like, okay, not your top 10 list. Like, well, how are you actually going to get it done? And that was harder than anything because you can't just fall back to the, like, standard position and a standard list. And that's what I think we have to do to have better government is ask really hard questions. Like, I think that's my main goal in office is to ask hard questions because if we're not vetting things well, if we're not thinking things through, um, the consequences are bad for our state. Um, anyway, anyone, what else? Yeah. Kind of following up on that, I, I, I know a woman that, that's uh, in the House, and she says it's very difficult to read every bill that comes through her desk. So kind of like the question that your constituent asked you, how do you um, keep knowledgeable? Well, so this is a huge challenge. So right now, our legislative system is very based around volume. So if you are looking at your state legislator, don't ask how many bills did they file. 
ask what they're working on. Because right now we have a system that very much rewards us for following a bunch of bills and trying to push things along. So people are impressed when I say I filed nine bills. Some people filed 30 bills, right? We had 2,800 bills filed last year and like 2,300 this year. Like you can't tell me there's that much policy that needs rapid change, right? You know these bills haven't been well thought through. You know they haven't, right? So our system does not enforce good policy through that. So that's number one. You, you know, I'm glad to show off if I get a bill passed, but just know that that doesn't mean good governance necessarily. Um, so for me, like I've spent all last year trying to learn who were trustworthy sources on different topics. So I mean, I almost have like a mental ro Rolodex of like, okay, if this issue comes up, who can I ask? Because I know I'm not going to know everything. So it's finding reliable voices. Um, sometimes that is lobbyists, you, but you have to know where they're coming from and who their, who their client is. Um, sometimes that's people I knew from before. Sometimes that's constituents. Um, but literally, I'm texting people at 9 or 10 at night for a bill that we're going to hear the next day that just got dropped, right? So sometimes it's very last minute. We also rely on teammates. So like I rely on the notes from other people that have read those bills. Um, Hopefully this year I'll do a better job of just sometimes being like, this makes no sense. Like that's something you, you don't want to make your colleagues look bad. Um, you know, that's part of, it's personal. You know, you're up there, there's 48 of you. You've got to be friendly with each other. You don't want to anger everybody, right? And so it's unpopular to say something like, this makes no sense. I don't understand this. Um, ideally, you talk to the author before you get to the committee meeting. But um, I want to do that more. Just like, I didn't have time to review this. Have you really thought through the consequences of this? You know, try to put it back on the author some to make sure. Because like, you know, like last year there was a bill that came to the Senate floor. It already made it through committee. And it was a big change to municipal law. And finally, someone asked, well, you know, did you talk to the municipal league, which is the state leaders for municipal government? Did you talk to city leaders? And he was like, well, they didn't tell me they had a problem with it. But you know, there's 2,800 bills last year, so they probably didn't even know this bill was there, or they didn't have time to follow up on every single bill. Um, so I think, um, for me, it's about being proactive, making sure I've talked to people that would be, um, and then asking the author to prove also that they've done the same. But it's not ideal. It's a very hasty process. Yeah. So did you vote on 2,800 bills, or they just were interested? They don't all, so not all the bills get heard in committee. So we have um, the leadership of the Senate makes decisions about what gets heard. So things get assigned to a committee by the floor leader, um, and then those committee chairs can choose not to hear things. Um, I think it ended up the governor signed about 500 bills last year, which was a record. Yeah, it's a lot of change. So, Yeah. So what do you think is the most critical issue that the state faces now? The most critical issue? Well, I mean, thematically, I think spending money on crisis instead of prevention or proactive. So every angle I looked at, be it health, be it education, be it infrastructure, we wait until it's a crisis and then it costs us a lot more. And so rather than be, and, and then we suddenly are like, oh yeah, this is our responsibility. So for instance, um, there's a, you know, somebody has a developmentally disabled child born, right? That is a huge challenge and burden for that family. Huge costs. Many, many people are bankrupted by trying to deal with the health of this child as they grow up. And social services don't necessarily help with that, right? Um, somebody might have to give up working to care for that kid as they grow. When they get out of um, public school, they're 18, there's nowhere for them to go, right? So we have a developmental disabilities waiting list that has 5,000 people on it. This is 5,000 people that are begging for help because they don't want to institutionalize their kid. They want to keep them at home. When we provide DDS services for a family, it's about $3,000 a year. We provide them things like personal care, um, some backup during the day, some extra help with some of the issues that they have. Um, if they go into an institution, it costs us $90,000 plus per year. So we're spending $90,000 on a crisis and that person not being able to be with their family, even if their family wants to have them at home, versus spending $3,000. We do this all across the board, but that's one of the most extreme examples, right? So I think prevention, being willing to, to plan ahead and not wait till something's a crisis. No. Mm -hmm. Outside of direct contact with senators and um, what are good ways for us to connect with our members? Hi. You call them. 
I knew somebody was gonna come. Hi. You're gonna start your you're gonna start talking? You're gonna give the talk now, right? We're following the sign that said in or through here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Other than direct contact. What are good ways for us to connect and be engaged in what's going on at the same time? I would recommend whatever issues you care about to find groups that advocate on those issues. So you do not have to follow every bill yourself. I'm in the building. I have a full-time executive assistant, and I don't know a lot of what's happening. And I know the system. I mean, it is confusing system. So rather than you feeling like you have to be the expert on every bill, find other people that care about the issues you have. So if you care a lot about children or the foster care system, there's the Institute for Child Advocacy great organization. They track bills. They'll tell you what to worry about and what not to worry about. Um, if you care about, um, you know, Freedom Oklahoma does a great job for LGBTQ. Um, there's a group that focuses on gun rights. If you care about, you know, us having more guns in more places, there's a group you can follow. So like if you care about a specific issue, there's probably a group advocating on that that can boil things down for you and help you know. Um, that would be my next suggestion. Anything else? So oh, much again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are you a hundred? I can't. I can't.